public benefit, which would include most charities, a religious corporation, and a mutual benefit. Mutual benefit would be more in the case of a social club or a country club that has proprietary members. Um, yeah, article three of the specimen that you have is about my shortest form possible. Um, and, and again, it's just a sample. Uh, article four, construction. Why, why would a good drafting lawyer include such a silly thing? Well, it's odd to me to see how frequently the IRS is as concerned about what you say you're going to do or not do than what you actually do or don't do. And I've had several cases where the service is questioning some element of the charity. You know, well, you're doing this and you shouldn't have done that. And well, we can't do that. See, it says we can't do that. And, and it sounds goofy, but I think that's, that's important. Um, Article five, restrictions. Uh, in order to be a 501c3, there are some basic rules. You need to be organized and operated exclusively for religious, charitable, or scientific purposes, or testing for public safety. Um, you need to have a legitimate charitable purpose, and in your case, what is that purpose? One of the most uh, well-recognized 501c3 charitable purposes um, is relief for the distressed and needy. Um, words that have taken on much more significance post 9-11 and post Hurricane Katrina, um, when there was such an outpouring of support for people that were wealthy. So what is needy? Well, needy is obvious, financial need. A person who is, because of the circumstances, needy, is, is a, that's a legitimate charitable purpose, if you will, to form an organization to help that person. Distressed. Distressed does not necessarily mean needy. Post-Katrina, there were benefits for poor people that were displaced by the hurricane. They were needy and they were distressed. There were wealthy persons with fancy homes who lost their homes and temporarily didn't have access to food, money, clothing. Those persons were distressed. And during the period of distress, that's a legitimate charitable purpose. You can't create a charitable organization unless it's for a bona fide charitable purpose. If you're an organization that helps people, um, there are some other more difficult, theoretically more difficult rules. One is that the recipients of your benefits, your charitable class, has to be indefinite or sufficiently large. You can't create a charity to take care of two specific otherwise worthy people because you need a broad charitable class, however worthy that person is. So when you read in the newspaper about some terrible family accident or disaster or some terribly disabled child, sometimes you'll see that the family has set up a bank account and you can help. That's not charitable. If people make a contribution to the bank account, they might try to write it off. But it is not a charitable uh, donation, and it is not deductible. And for your purpose, you can't create an organization to benefit that person, because you need a large class. Um, you can't have private endearment, which is to say you can't have excessive financial benefit for insiders in your organization. You cannot engage in substantial lod uh, lobbying. The rule is that to be a 501c3, no significant part of your activities can be relating to lobbying or similar political activity. What is significant? Well, nobody knows. If you review the rulings in case law, it looks like 5%, but the IRS steadfastly refuses to say there's a rule. Um, there's also an election that you can make if you want to slightly increase. The cap on uh, getting involved in campaigns for political office is zero. No staff time, no money, no resources ever. And that's, that's going to be pretty, pretty important. Going back to uh, my article for just a moment, you can see some of the other things you need to do. Under Article 6, you need to designate your registered office and agent. A nonprofit corporation is a real corporation, and it can be sued. And how do you sue or how do you serve a corporation? You need to have a registered agent who can accept service of process and notices. Um, in Oregon, if you look at Article 8, in Oregon the rule is that you may designate your initial directors, you need not. My philosophy, which if you look at the bottom of page 2, is I think articles of incorporation are almost aspirational, almost sacred. You file them, you forget them, you don't forget them. 
you don't amend them, maybe ever. The bylaws, which as I said earlier, are adopted by the board at the organizational <coughs> meeting. In my view, that fleshes out the, the operating rules, if you will, for the corporation. And at the bottom of page two, you'll see, as I usually do, uh, I provide that the number, terms, and manner of appointment and removal of directors will be provided in the bylaws. Keep it out of the articles, at least that's my theory. Uh, article nine, members. You can have either a member or a non-member nonprofit corporation in Oregon. I hate member corporations. It's almost like having shareholders. Um, and I think the danger of a palace coup with a small group of disgruntled members is quite high. Are you a member organization or non-member? Excellent. However, I also, if you, if you look at Article 9, um, people who give you a bunch of money like more than a receipt. They want to be a member. And so my deceptive little practice is usually to include a provision that says we are a non-member corporation, but we can still designate donors and others as members who have only the rights provided in the bylaws whatever those rights might be. Article 10 is required under the Internal Revenue Code. It is mandatory to have a provision to the effect that in the event of dissolution of the corporation, all the assets will be distributed only to other bona fide charitable organizations, which is to say, not to people. Um, I'll get into this a little later, but Articles 11 and 12 are designed to give comfort to your board members. To, to remind them that as a volunteer board member, they are entitled to certain things, including limited personal liability and mandatory indemnities. But I'll talk about that later on. I don't know that I need to talk much about the bylaws. I just wanted to give you a specimen to show you how I do that. I'll go back and, and talk about those in a little more detail later. So from a tax point, tax standpoint, again, just because you're an Oregon nonprofit corporation doesn't have any bearing on your federal tax status. If you want to be exempt from income tax, you need to apply to the IRS using this monster form 1023 that seems to grow every year. Once you are recognized as a 501c3, there's a second set of rules. From a tax standpoint, all 501c3 charities are presumed to be what's called a private foundation rather than a public charity, unless the organization qualifies not only as a 501c3 following the rules we talked about, but also as a public charity, which usually requires that you can demonstrate broad-based public support, which is to say a relatively large number of relatively small gifts. The rules have changed a lot in recent years, but the rule now is you fill out the Form 1023, and we'll look at part of that in just a second, and you demonstrate through financial projections that you have a good expectation of meeting this broad-based public support. And if the service agrees, the service will give you a determination letter that says, okay, we recognize you not only as a 501c3 charity, but also as a public charity. Now you go forth and do your thing, and every year you're going to report back, and we're going to follow your broad-based public support. And if and when you ever fail those tests, we're going to come in and reclassify you as a private foundation. Until last year, the rule was that, that a new organization that can demonstrate a reasonable expectation of qualifying as a public charity would be treated as one during a five-year advance ruling period, which is to say the service would say, you ought to do your good work, and five years later or four years later, depending on what year it was, you go back and you fill out a form that shows whether you have it. For organizations like Birch, this is not an issue unless you are lucky or unlucky enough to have a sugar daddy donor. If you've got one donor who is making a contribution every year of 50% of your operating budget, that's a great problem to have, but it means that these hyper-technical issues I'm talking about become relevant. If you have more of a grassroots fundraising and food raising operation, for most organizations, these technical distinctions are never relevant. And I, I presume for Birch, never an issue? Not yet. Well, like I said, it's, sometimes it's a good problem to have. It's like a donor, uh, too big a donor? Well, I'm sure you are. <laughs> so how did you guys goof up your 501c3? 
So then you had your file later and probably wasn't retroactive. So I closed it and then go back and reopen it and get back. And this was in ninety four. So it's been <coughs> we and <coughs> so I'll tell the story later on how that happened. I've seen every iteration of that problem. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've seen you you have fire in the belly and you recruit some board members and you're going to create this organization, organization, you're going to do great works and you've got enthusiasm, momentum, and hard work and you go and pretty soon you get all wrapped up in what you're doing and forget that you've got these pesky tax and technical issues. Um, I have filed lots of these applications at the 11th hour. Because of that, um, the normal rule is, let me see if I can get this right because it's like a bit complicated. So the normal rule is you need to file your Form 1023 within 15 months after the date of your organization. And if you receive a favorable determination letter, and you almost always will, I've only failed to get a determination letter about three or four times, and in two of those, they were right anyway. But if you get a favorable determination, it will relate back to your date of incorporation. So with the benefit of hindsight, you were a tax-exempt charitable organization from your instant of creation, eligible from that date back then to solicit and receive tax-deductible charitable contributions. During this interim period, it's a little tough, though, for you to fundraise because what you really you need to make sure you disclose, we're a new organization, our 501c3 is pending. You can't represent that you're a charity or that, that contributions are deductible unless and until Uncle Sugar gives you that letter, and that's a critical, critical issue. There are ways to raise funds in between. Yes, sir. Thanks for getting this here. Uh, Marcy Matosa, the director of Hope Station, which was our first BCS clone, has had Dave write two grants for them. It was kind of funny uh, because she'd never written a grant before, never worked with a grant writer. So uh, because of his familiarity with BCS and basically how the program worked and knowing that that Hope Station was a little smaller, uh, a lot smaller, <laughs> but basically th had the same mission, uh, it was easier for him to write knowledgeable grants for, grant for Hope Station. And so they applied for two grants and got them both. So she thinks that's how it works with grant writing. You write a grant and someone gives you money. So, but it was great experience for her. Um, I'm just going to turn it over to Dave. He has about an hour. He's going to make a presentation to you and leave a little bit of time for questions for when he's done. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, as as uh, Suzanne mentioned, um, I've been working with the organization for a number of years now, and um, we've uh, had grants awarded from a number of different foundations, a number of uh, different sources. Uh, including uh, grants for a couple of uh, semi-tractor trailer trucks, um, just recently a smaller truck. What's that truck called? I think that's a box van. Oh, the Sprinter? Yeah, the Sprinter, <laughs> Sprinter truck. I was trying to remember what the kind of truck they called it. Um, pallet jacks, uh, staffing, recently uh, replacing the compressors on all of the uh, freezers and coolers at the warehouse. So. Uh, for a lot of different things. Uh, yeah, for the adult education program. Uh, so there's, they're, they're obviously the uh, grants uh, have increased the capacity of BCS to better serve their target population. But there's a few things I want to really, if there's nothing else you take away from this part of the seminar, it's uh, that you remember these myth busters. There's a lot of false information out there about grants. You can waste an incredible amount of time on pursuing grants uh, that uh, is, is just that, exactly that, a waste of time. So the number one myth, um, because it comes up all the time, is that uh, grants are free money. Well. Let's, let's take a look at that. Uh, let's look at time. Do you have loads and loads and loads of free time? 
If you do, then this question's not relevant to you. But my guess is that you as leaders of your nonprofit organizations, uh, for you, time is precious. You've got lots of different tasks that you have to accomplish. And grant writing should not be a major task for you. Um, so time, people say a lot of times, time is money. Um, and in this case, I think it definitely is. So it does take time to put together a grant application, and not even just to put together the application, but to get prepared for putting together an application. We'll be talking about that some more. <clears throat> The other thing that you need to consider when you talk about money and grants is leverage. And what do we mean by leverage? That means that in almost all cases, grant makers are expecting that you're going to come to the table. You're going to be asking them for their partnership in your enterprise. Uh, and you're coming to the table not with your hands empty not with your cap outstretched, saying, give me, and, and as most of you know, uh, one of the mottos for BCS is a hand up, not a hand out. This applies perfectly to grants as well. You're not asking for a handout from the foundations. You're saying, we have some things going for us. And we have some resources available, okay? Uh, and, but, and those resources need to be applied in some way towards whatever project you're talking about. So those are, that's a commitment you make of dollars in kind, uh, volunteer hours, whatever it is. Um, but if you do that, then that gives you some leverage in getting the grant dollars. In some cases, uh, not a lot, but particularly with government grants, you actually have to match the amount you're asking for with a dollar commitment. So for instance, if they say a 50-50 match for the grant, if you ask for uh, $10,000, you're saying we're going to contribute $10,000 towards a $20,000 project. OK, and that you have the money in hand. <laughs> OK, so time, leverage, and let's talk about accountability, OK? Almost all grant makers require reports. They require some kind of a system in place for you to be tracking the outcomes that you're promising through your grant application. So that, uh, most of that may uh, uh, you know, impact uh, time, but it may, it may even come to a dollar amount if you've got, uh, for instance, a bookkeeper who you have on contract, and that bookkeeper is going to need to do extra work to report on the results of the grant dollars, uh, then that's money that you're going to need to invest. Okay? So that's kind of myth number one that uh, is, well, this is going to be a, <laughs> this is kind of like uh, taking a band aid off. Uh, let's do this. <laughs> let's just do this. But we'll be coming back. We'll be coming back to that. Okay. Myth number two: Grants are a major source of revenue for most nonprofits. So, uh, in the newspaper, you hear about uh, such and such nonprofit getting these big grants to do what they want to do, and you may think, "Wow, that's uh, you know, that's if they're getting grants." Maybe that's how they're kind of doing all the different activities and funding the different costs that they have. Um, the fact is, is that uh, for most, most nonprofits, and certainly for BCS, uh, most of the revenue that comes in that's cash revenue, obviously, you know, you'd be talking about the non-cash revenue, the product donations that come in, that's, that's the biggest source of revenue. But let's look at just cash revenue and you look at uh, cash re revenue, and most of that is from participant fees being paid. And the participants pay, pay a service fee. And that's part of the BCS model. That, that is the major source of cash income for B 
BCS. For other nonprofits, it may be, um, I mean, for most nonprofits, it's a donor base. So individual donations coming in, okay? And that, uh, that's as a result of their fundraising capacity. Um, the fact is, if you took a pie that represents all of your uh, cash revenue for a nonprofit, in most cases, typically a nonprofit's grant portion of that pie is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Okay? So, not a major slice, but as we will see later on, it can be a very important one. And just because you got a snapshot for, uh, say, uh, 2012 that looks like this in terms of the revenue that's coming in, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's all that this grant is contributing to the organization in terms of uh, what it can do for you. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, myth number three. The more grant applications you submit, the better your chances for getting a grant. That's looking at grant application process like the lottery. And uh, the grant application process is not, not like the lottery. It's nothing like a lottery. Because with the lottery, every, um, uh, every ticket that you buy, every time you, you get one of those uh, uh, chances for uh, uh, the $20 million or whatever, that actually goes into, even though it's 20 million to one, it's at least that. Whereas if you go to a grant maker with a grant that has no chance at all of getting funded because it doesn't meet their mission, it doesn't meet their eligibility requirements, it doesn't, you, you don't have your 501c3, that, the chances of you getting that grant, zero. Okay? So that's time completely wasted. So um, this, uh, this uh, what you might call a shotgun approach, uh, is, is not a good, waste, uh, not a good uh, uh, use of your time. And uh, if you want to be more effective and efficient, you need to really know the grant maker. And we're going to get in, into that in a minute. <laughs> OK, so you look at this, and you th you're thinking, well, uh, you know, so what good are grants? Well, let's look at this. Um, although grants are not free money, they, they do represent a source for specific costs that you have identified as being important to the growth of your organization. Okay? If you can do a good job of identifying that cost and of identifying uh, and determining how that cost is going to help your organization to grow and to better serve your target population, then um, it's mo money that is wisely invested. Okay, so uh, although it's not, grants aren't free, uh, they can be a very wise investment that will pay dividends later on. Let's go back to this. As I said earlier, although this looks like a pretty small slice of the pie, Grants that are invested now in, in certain kinds of expenses can m mean dividends in the future, and it can mean that you're, save you're actually saving the need for more revenue. Let me give you an example. Um, the trucks that uh, we were able to get for BCS through uh, the grants that we got, um, they replaced trucks that were becoming more costly, they were becoming more inefficient. They were essentially becoming non-effective. They represented a, an increasing cost year by year to the organization. The same thing with the compressors that had to be replaced, uh, which sometimes in a couple of cases, I think, uh, when the compressor, the old compressors failed on uh, these refrigeration units, uh, a lot of the product uh, had to be thrown out because it spoiled. <coughs> and so those are costs that are borne by the organization because you're not replacing certain kinds of equipment. Okay, so 
so the fact that you know this this may look like a small slice of the pie, but in future years, what it means is that uh, that truck, that piece of equipment, that staff person is actually going to save you a lot of need for additional revenue. Okay? More grant applications to submit, the better your chances for getting a grant. The way to approach this is to, again, look at where you're uh, applying to. You know, who is the grant maker? Uh, what do they want? Okay, and we're going to get into that in a minute. Um, I'd like you to turn to your in your handouts to page two of my of the section for me. Uh, that's the checklist. Um, so the question to ask is: Is my organization ready to apply for a grant? Okay, I, I'm so glad that Jeff preceded me because. All of what he was talking about with respect to uh, getting your uh, 501c3 status is extremely relevant. Uh, as he mentioned, it's possible in some cases to get a grant, even if, if you don't have a 501c3, but as he emphasized, it's very difficult. You don't want to go there. Get your 501c3 status first. Have your IRS uh, letter, designation letter in hand and then apply for your grants. Okay, has your board approved the amount to be requested and the proposed use of the grant? Uh, this is uh, an issue that some grant makers actually will ask you about. And uh, in some cases, they even require the board chair's signature on your grant application. So uh, that's an important thing to, to, for you to check off. Uh, does your organization have a credible track record to show that it has been successful in achieving this mission. I, I had uh, someone come to me once, and uh, she had a program uh, she wanted to start in Africa, and she had a lot of uh, donors behind her um, who had already been donating for a couple of years for her to make trips over there. And she says, I want to apply for a grant. And I said, um, well, OK. What, uh, what, is, what does your program do? What is your program doing right now? She said, well, I haven't started it yet. That's why I need a grant. And I said, well, in most cases, a grant maker would like to see that you actually have the capability to do what you're promising to do in your grant application. And that means documenting the success that you've had so far in meeting a certain need. So make sure that you have at least, you know, if it's, even if it's just a year that you've been in existence, and uh, there was an earlier question about um, um, is, is it required to document volunteer hours or, volu or to document in kind. That, don't even ask a question about required. It's a best practice. It's something you need to do. Okay, because that's, those are the kinds of things that grant makers really want to see in your application. Uh, Up-to-date statements that show the current financial situation of your organization and a current organizational budget. Th these, this is um, standard in all grant applications. They're all going to ask for that. So make sure you've got those. Uh, and then do you have the organizational capacity to expend the grant funds? Um, I don't know if, if any of you have applied for grants in the past and, be to and been told, uh, well, we, we as a grant maker have a policy against tipping it's not tipping like in, in the sense of giving somebody 10 bucks for services. Uh, tipping in uh, the philanthropic community simply is the, the idea of, a, of an organization asking for grants that exceed fifth, by 50 percent, no, no, exceed, uh, put it another way, if uh, the, the size of the grant or grants is more than 50 percent of the last year's or latest year's revenues, then they're going to say, no, that, that's against our tipping policy. Okay, do you understand that? So it means that if you're a small organization, you had uh, revenues last year $25,000, then it's very unlikely someone is going to fund a grant for $12,000, $13,000. And definitely they're not going to fund a grant for $25,000. Okay? So, there's a certain 
um, uh, uh, st strategy that's involved in uh, looking for small grants to start with, if you're a small organization, and then having those uh, gradually help you to grow. And as you grow, then you can ask for, start asking for larger grants. Okay, have you researched the grant makers? Uh, so this is, um, this is a real basic check checklist, and I want you to notice uh, that if you uh, take the first letters of each one of those uh, elements, what do they spell? This is the meat of your grant application. Okay, the meat of your whole decision, really, about whether to apply for a grant. First of all, does your application uh, line up with the mission of the organization you're applying for? Um, Meyer Memorial Trust, for instance, has a pretty broad mission, uh, but there are some things that they don't fund. Um, there are a lot of smaller organizations that have a pretty narrow mission. Uh, Warren Young Trust, uh, here in Oregon, uh, they fund organizations that um, uh, particularly uh, have youth services as part of, uh, as a central part of their mission. Okay, so you want to look at, first of all, does their mission really, does it completely preclude you from applying to them? Uh, and secondly, if it looks like it, it may include uh, something to do with your organization, uh, is it a central part of what the organization is, uh, is funding? Eligible costs. Um, uh, there are a lot of examples of inel ineligible costs, and one of them I can give you right away is that no foundation will fund debt. So if you've got a debt that you've accumulated and uh, you know, it's $50,000, um, uh, the grant-making organizations will not help you to pay for that debt. Okay? Um, the amount that they are prepared to give in a grant, uh, so there are all sizes of foundations out there. Uh, when we talk about uh, Oregon Community Foundation, OCF, Meyer Memorial Trust, Murdoch, those are the big boys, and they give quite large grants. Um, uh, but a lot of uh, the, the majority of foundations are much smaller than that. They have assets you know, under a million dollars. So they're giving grants of maybe uh, $5,000 uh, per grant award per year. And they may have only 10 to give in a grant. Uh, so there are all sizes of foundations out there. Uh, when you talk about uh, Oregon Community Foundation, OCF, Meyer Memorial Trust, Murdoch, those are the big boys. And they give quite large grants. Um, uh, but a lot of uh, the, the majority of foundations are much smaller than that. They have assets you know, under a million dollars. So they're giving grants of maybe uh, $5,000 uh, per grant award per year. And they may have only 10 grant awards that they give a year, $5,000 each. Or they may have 50, but they're still $5,000 each. That's something you need to find out. What is the amount that they are prepared to give? And that will determine how much you're going to ask for, obviously. The time frame for submission of a grant, that simply means look at whether they've got a deadline, a grant deadline, and be sure that you get your act together and your materials together and get it in uh, before the deadline. Okay. Uh, do you have a plan for sustaining the funded activities after the grant funds are expended? A lot of grant makers are looking for the sustainability plan that you're going to have. You know, after what they don't want is for you to ask for $10,000 this year and then come right back to them next year and say, we want another $10,000 for the same project. Okay? They, want to, they want to know, how are you going to take that $10,000 and then uh, build the capacity of your organization so that you don't need to ask us for more money for that particular project? You can go back to the grant makers and ask for other projects or other, um, maybe other pieces of equipment, etc. Uh, but um, you need to be thinking about, about that issue. 
And finally, uh, we already talked about the time that it takes. And are you prepared to spend that amount of time? Okay. Um, so let's say that you've decided, we've, we've checked off all those uh, 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 elements, and we're ready to go. And uh, then the next thing to look at is uh, what's on page one, which is kind of a, a checklist in itself about must-have information for submitting a grant. Um, there are the different elements of preparing a grant can really be divided into about uh, four or five sections. One of them is project development, another planning, analysis, research, and then the actual writing of the grant and submitting. Project development is how much you're going to ask. Okay, so get a, get a real good grip on what it is that you're going to actually ask for in the grant. What will, you, what will that amount buy? Okay, what will this item position service that you bought allow you to do that you can't do now? How will that benefit your target group? Do you have a budget for the project that this grant will make possible? And then in terms of uh, planning, um, uh, Suzanne had talked about the importance of having a mission statement. Um, it's always a good idea to have a strategic plan in place. It doesn't have to be real fancy. It doesn't have to be a lot of detail. But it's, it's something that shows that your board has sat down and talked about, you know, what can we do beyond just this year that's going to help us to grow? What can we do beyond this year that is going to make us a better player and a bigger player in our community? Um, and the strategic plan has its different uh, uh, elements that I talk about here. And then in terms of analysis, you have to uh, be thinking about the evidence that you have for the need that you're trying to address. Um, a, a big part of your grant application is going to be a need statement where you say, We've identified this need in our community. And uh, there's a, 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 on page um, uh, five of your application, there's, there's some uh, things to look at for there. I won't go through all of them right now. Uh, the the uh, uh, last part of it is uh, writing and submitting an application. And that's going to require, again, uh, this time factor that we're talking about. So let's say you've, you've got all that, you've, you've uh, got the documentation you need, you've got the uh, uh, sort of the things in place for um, actually writing a proposal. So let's look at what some of the elements of winning proposals are. OK, and I know you can't read this very well, but this is, <laughs> this is in your handout on the slides. I don't know where, which page it's in. Um, it's the one that's called winning proposal. It's got the, is, it, is, is that included there, Suzanne? Maybe not. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, well let, me, let me talk about uh, just briefly about a logic model. Have any, have any of you done a logic model before? Are you familiar with logic model? Okay. Um, what, what a logic model does is it is a, a tool for you to plan your project. It's also a way for you to present information to a grant maker uh, if they ask for something like this uh, that shows that you've made a clear connection between the goal of your project and all these other elements that you've included in your project description. Outcomes, outputs, activities, and inputs. OK? This bottom line here talks about inputs. So you've got, for, for example, uh, let's say you've identified a goal of uh, better serving uh, hungry families by providing uh, nutrition education classes. OK? For those classes, you may need to have staff. You may need equipment. Um, you may need uh, supplies. You may need contractors. Or maybe just, in this case, you might just need some contractor, contracted instructors 
and the supplies for the classes. Those are going to lead to a, an activity that you're providing, in this case, the classes themselves. The activities will resu result in a quantifiable output. Uh, output, well, let's say in this case, it's that you're going to have 50 families complete the nutrition classes within one year. But just because you've got 50 families completing the class doesn't necessarily mean they're getting anything out of it. So that's where an outcome comes in. And you notice here we've got two different levels. There are short-term outcomes. For example, um, by, by having these nutrition classes, uh, the uh, families now have the knowledge to know how to better uh, and more effectively provide uh, wholesome food to their Households. Okay, that's a short-term outcome because uh, they've got that going right now. The strategic outcome is that if they have these uh, these better uh, uh, this better knowledge of uh, nutritional requirements and so on and so forth, they're going to actually take the, that knowledge and apply it in behavioral ways. That means that even at, long after the class is finished. They're going to be going and buying the kinds of food that they should be buying, eating the kinds of food they need to eat. Behavioral changes. And those come to some kind of an objective that leads to your goal. Okay, so that's, that's the logic model. Here's another way of looking at it. If you had, a, uh, for example, a youth financial literacy program, you would have... Uh, you would begin by saying, we want a grant that represents partners investing resources so that a high school financial planning program is developed and delivered in high schools so that teens gain knowledge and skills in money management, so that teens make better decisions about the use of money, so that teens establish sound financial habits. You, you note that on each, between each step of this, th there are those two words, so that. You know, uh, it's, it's the answer to the question, so what? <laughs> so, so teens gain knowledge and skills in money, money management. So what? Well, teens make better decisions about the use of money. You ask, so what? Well, teens establish sound financial habits. Okay, let's... Look at an example of, of a, a parent education program. You provide a parent education program through, uh, this is, this is an actual program called Healthy Start, through home visitation. That's the activity. So you're providing this activity so that 50 parents will complete the course. That's your output. So that you achieve the primary outcome of a quality parent-child interaction. So that parent guidance and discipline increases, that's your long-term outcome, so that child maltreatment is reduced, that's a strategic outcome, so that children in the district enter school ready to learn. Now you notice that the goal here is actually that children in the district are going to enter school ready to learn. Will this activity by itself ensure this is going to happen? No, but there's, by having this logic model, you've established a causative chain that shows that at least to some extent, this activity, this program, will lead to uh, children in the district being uh, ready to learn. Uh, so how, but how are you going to mention, or how are you going to uh, measure all that? Uh, in this case, the output of providing parent education through home visitation one indicator is the percentage of families completing the program. And the tool that's used is program records. You've got an outcome of the quality of parent-child ch interaction increases. The indicator is the percentage of families demonstrating positive functioning. And the tools are a worker observation of parent-child interaction and a parent survey. Um, uh, BCS uh, does a survey every year. To show to, that shows what families are taking away in terms of 
the food and other products that they pick up from, uh, from the warehouse. And that's, uh, that's an output, uh, but it also can be a, an outcome in terms of uh, knowing that uh, with those kinds of healthy foods that they're, they're taking, uh, the nutrition of the families is uh, being more effectively met. And then uh, the last one, this goal, in this case, children entering school are ready to learn. An indicator is a percentage of children entering the school ready to learn and the assessment of child development uh, through, in this case, an ages and stages questionnaire is the way that you measure it. It's the tool that you use. Okay, we talked about leveraging resources. Here's your task. Focus on a glass half full, not half empty. So um, if you're taking the approach that if we can show that we're the neediest organization, then that's going to help us to get a grant from such and such a grant maker. Grant makers, this is the big secret <laughs> that's out there. Grant makers do not award grants on the basis of weaknesses or need. They award it on the basis of strengths. Okay, that, that sounds backwards, doesn't it? Don't the foundations, don't they want to help meet a need? Of course they do. But the way in which they they have determined they want to meet those needs is through organizations that are best prepared and most appropriate for meeting that need. So your task is to show them you are the best prepared, you are the most appropriate organization to meet that particular need that's out there. So what does that mean? Uh, funders generally do not fund pre-project costs. What do we mean by pre-project costs? Well, I already mentioned debts. They won't fund debts. Those are all, that's money that's already out your door. And they're saying, you know, don't come to us to, to pay those off. Uh, but they could also include something like, um, what if you had, what if you wanted to uh, uh, build a, a new facility? Um, um, you want to build your own warehouse. And you, you go to the grant maker and you say, <clears throat> well, we've already got the architectural design uh, in place. And... Um, we want to use the grant to help to pay the architect because we haven't paid him yet. Uh, in some ways, that's like a debt. Uh, even if the architect says, I, you know, it's not really a debt, but if he's expecting some kind of a compensation, that's a pre-project cost. You've already, in, a, in essence, you've started the project already without asking for the grant maker to help provide you with some money for it. So um, in that case, the you know, grant maker will say, why do you need our help? You've already started. Okay? You want to make sure that when you go to the grant maker, you are saying, you know, we haven't got the project going yet, but we do have a lot of things in place. Okay? Funders are looking for projects where 50% of the assets are already on the table. Okay? Well, and what do we, does that mean, oh, gosh, we've got to come up with all that money? Not necessarily, because remember, a lot of the assets that we're talking about here are in kind. So if you've got a lot of volunteers who are working for your organization, document their time and show that you know, we have volunteers who have done this much toward uh, projects we've had in the past. We intend to use that volunteer time also towards this new project. Um, in kind. You, you may have uh, uh, a major donor who says, you know, I. I can commit some equipment. I can, I've got some equipment that uh, is, is in good working condition, and I want to uh, pledge that towards the organization. Uh, so when we talk about pre-project costs, that doesn't include commitments. That doesn't include pledges. And if you, could get, if you can get those kinds of pledges in place, then uh, you're well on your way. So, as it says, uh, you know, funders look for projects where some fundraising volunteerism has already been taken into account and documented. So, count your assets at the same time that you count the cost. Okay, you know what, you're, you, know what you need in terms of cash to get your project completed or to buy your piece of equipment or bu to buy your supplies. Uh, now it's time to figure out what can I bring to the table? So... Again, it's 
personnel. Uh, if, you've, if you've got, uh, uh, so what's the difference between pro bono and in kind? I mean, pro bono essentially means if you've got a professional who is willing to commit a certain amount of their time to complete a technical part of your project. You know, in, in the case of the compressors, it was that uh, we had uh, a, a retired uh, technician who said, I will give you know, 10, 15 hours of my time to help install those compressors. That's money, basically. Um, so we were able to include that in our grant application. Uh, in kind uh, is all the, um, of course, uh, the, the product donations, any other kind of donation that comes in that, is, um, uh, that represents something that is going to help you to achieve this project. Uh, and then volunteer hours, obviously. Um, so that's, that's the personnel. Supplies and materials, I mentioned those in kind. Equipment, facilities. Um, let's say you've got a, an adult education program. Um, BCS uh, has, uh, is it this church where the AEP, uh, the uh, Good Sense classes are held? Mountain View Church. Uh, allows us to use their facilities to provide the uh, classes for the uh, Good Sense course on a regular basis. So that's, uh, that means we don't have to rent a facility for that to happen. Okay, so the key here is document, document, document. Make sure that you've got some paper trail that shows. If you, you, know, if you, you can't just say, well, last year we had 100 volunteer hours. If you can't back it up with uh, logs, now the grant makers usually don't ask for that information up front, but they may make it a condition of the awarding of the grant that they want to come to your site and actually look at volunteer logs, in kind donations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? All right, let, uh, let's talk a little bit about how am I doing? Whoa. Okay. Uh, let's quickly go through proposal, um, proposal writing. Uh, probably the best thing is for you to go to page four, the top ten mistakes that grant writers make. And let's, let's quickly go through those. So wagging the dog, what do I mean by that? Um, you... You hear about some grant funding opportunity. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, X Foundation is giving grants for, um, uh, for a certain kind of uh, project, and they're $50,000, uh, up to $50,000, and you say, wow, we could use $50,000. But it's not for the kind of project that they're offering the money for. Um, so you, you sit down and you say, can we kind of uh, uh, tweak this or, or, or shape our project in a way that will make it eligible for this grant funding. Uh, that's the wrong approach. What you need to do is figure out what money do we need exactly to do what we want to do. Okay? Uh, number two, putting a square peg into a round hole. Applying to the wrong foundation or federal program. Again, this, this is the same kind of uh, idea where you're applying to a foundation that, may, that has said, we will only fund uh, programs that help uh, senior citizens. And, you're, and you are applying for a grant that is uh, you know, like an AEP or uh, for something that is going to specifically help families. Okay, uh, and you may say, well, some of those families include senior citizens. Uh, that's a stretch because they're probably going to come back and say, you know, we really focus on senior citizens. Your project is not focusing on their needs. It's helping them, but as almost a, you know, a side benefit. Okay, trying to beat the clock, not allowing sufficient time to plan, develop, and write your proposal. So plan ahead, set a schedule, and don't rush. Promising the moon or not. This uh, refers to the realisticness of your application. You want to you want to kind of wow your grant maker by saying if, you know, if we could get 
this grant, it's, it, it's sort of the last piece in this puzzle. It's going to allow us to do some amazing things. Um, that's good, but don't make them too amazing. <laughs> don't overpromise and say, uh, you know, if we just had this grant, uh, we could do all kinds of things without really knowing that uh, you can show clearly that you can accomplish those outputs. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to uh, you want to say, well, if we had this grant, we could help uh, you know three families, a grant of ten thousand uh, dollars. So look at the cost benefit in terms of if you're asking for ten thousand, twelve thousand, fifteen thousand dollars. Um, how many people in your target group can you confidently say you're going to be able to help? And it should be a, a pretty large number for that size of grant. Okay, not connecting the dots. Uh, that's where you want to make sure you're using a logic model. And on the uh, obverse side, um, you've got number six, RFP. What RFP? RFP is a request for proposals. Or a GFA is a, just another name for an RFP. Leaving out important components of a proposal by not reading the RFP carefully. So, it, you know, I told you earlier, I, I want you to go away uh, from this at least knowing what, what the myth-busting parts of grants are. If there's another thing that I want you to go away with, it's to follow instructions. What do I mean by that? Grant makers have different, you know, all, they've got all kinds of different requirements in terms of what they want to see in a proposal. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could just write one proposal and, you know, getting back to the old shotgun method, <laughs> just one, write one proposal and it's one size fits all and you send it to as many foundations as, you, as possible. Um, but they all have specific needs and requirements. <coughs> and so you want to make sure that you are meeting their requirements to the letter. And that requires, you know, looking at, you know, They'll have an announcement somewhere of the grants they want to make, or it'll be included in their mission statement, it'll be included on their website, uh, wherever it is. If, if there's not documentation out there, then you need to get in touch with the grant maker yourself, call them on the phone and say, what do you require? We, we want to apply for a grant of you know, $5,000. Okay. Uh, number seven, it's elementary, my dear Watson, a lack of evidence. Uh, we talked about backing up your statements to documentation. Uh, number eight, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. If you have some fundamental problems in your organization, you need to address those first because uh, the last thing you need is, um, you know, like Jeff was saying, a, sort of a, a problem, uh, which we had this problem. Last thing you need is a grant for $50,000 and your organization is a mess. Uh, because what it's going to do is uh, you're not going to be able to carry out the activities that you promised you were going to do, and you're going to have a black mark on your organization, not only with that foundation. There's another thing to keep in mind. These foundations talk to each other. And uh, if you apply to uh, Foundation X on the year after that, uh, and you had, you had applied for Foundation Y before and made a hash of the grant that they gave you, uh, Foundation X is going to call Foundation Y and say, um, you know, this organization has applied for $10,000, so what do you think? And what do you think Foundation Y is going to say? So you want to make sure that you're in good shape before you apply for a grant. Uh, number nine, destroying the forest. Okay, that's... Um, easily uh, uh, essentially what you need to do is make sure that you're concise okay and 10 abuse of the language uh, that's another uh, big problem using too many words using words that are flowery etc cetera, etc cetera. okay we're gonna, look at, we're gonna look at one last thing here and that is um, grant writing what I call the magic five C's these are the elements you want in an award-winning proposal. First of all, you want to make sure that your proposal is clear, okay? Uh, if, if they can't follow the logic in your proposal, um, it's, it's not going to get funded. They, they, they want to make sure that you, are, you give every evidence of being very clear in your goals, your objectives, 
what you want to do, how you're going to accomplish it, and how you're going to show that you've accomplished it. Uh, so what's the difference between being clear and concise? Well, you can be very clear and have a 50-page application and be re really clear in it, but in most cases, grant makers will have a page limitation. In some cases, they'll even have a character <laughs> limitation, especially the online applications. They'll say, you get, you got 200 characters to, to, put your, to explain this particular section of the proposal. Um, so you, you need to be really sparse with your words, okay, and, and just as concise as possible. Uh, they, they won't give you extra points for using a lot of flowery language and a lot of descriptive information. Um, so, on the other hand, you do want to be compelling. You want to show that this is a need that is urgent. And so that comes, that's going to come out in your need statement. You want to make a real clear um, statement that um, this is important to the community, what we're, what we're trying to do to help. And then you want to clearly show that you are going to do that. Uh, in some cases, um, you might want to even have an anecdote in there. An anecdote meaning uh, a story, a real brief one, about a particular participant that was helped by your program and how they were helped. And the, the, the clear connection you can make between what that participant received from your organization and how it was able to help them is, is going to make it more compelling. Uh, comprehensive. Um, you want to make sure that you're kind of covering all the bases with respect to uh, your application. So you're going to want uh, uh, to make sure you, you've got a good need statement. You want to show that you've got uh, your methodology in place. Uh, you want to talk about the uh, management plan, so the capacity of your organization to do this. And then finally, is it complete? Now, what's the difference between comp being comprehensive and complete? Complete simply means it's going back to that follow the instructions part. So a complete application, um, obviously, it's, uh, you're going to want to have a comprehensive proposal as part of that complete application. But grant makers also require other pieces of their application. So you want to make sure if they want a cover letter, actually, even if they don't ask for a cover letter, put in a cover letter anyway. That's, a good That's always a good idea. So cover letter, um, they'll, almost all of them want a 501c3 letter. Almost all of them want a board roster. Almost all of them want a, uh, uh, your current financial statements. Almost all of them want a current organization budget. Okay, so those are, those are just the standards. Um, again, if you read the instructions carefully, you'll see what other pieces do they want you to include in the application, and if you get those all in, then it will be complete. Okay? We don't have much time, but I want to open it up for questions, in case you have any. Yes? I understand it's very difficult to get a grant for operational um, expenses. Uh -huh. um, that's, that's a very good question, because to some extent, that's changing. Um, for a long time, foundations, uh, almost as a matter of policy, uh, would not fund uh, grants for just operations. You know, basically, so so what, we, what do we mean by operations? It means, like you say, you know, it's, it's costing us um, uh, $50,000 a year for our overhead just to, just to ba do our basic op operations, you know, for, for overhead for uh, maybe staff, uh, rent, utilities, et cetera, et cetera. And this year, we're probably only going to take in 40000 So we need 10000 for this operating cost. Uh, in the, like I said, in the past, foundations would say, uh, no, we won't fund that kind of thing. That's changing. The foundations are more and more. If you can make a really good statement to say, we have really suffered as a result of the economic turndown or uh, we've lost some major donors or whatever, whatever you can document and back up the justification, um, then uh, they may be willing 
to uh, provide some operational. Now, does that mean, you know, if you've got $50,000 as your operational budget, you should ask for $50,000? No. <laughs> no, but, but show where the gap is. Show clearly where you are um, expecting the gap to be between uh, how you're going to cover your overhead and the actual overhead costs. Okay. Yes, another question. Uh, that's another good it's because I only had an hour um, I, I, I was hoping that we could uh, cover that um, I'd say the best place to start would be to just talk to other nonprofits in your community where did you get your grants you know nonprofits that have gotten grants in the past uh, where did you get your grant uh, what uh, what kinds of grants uh, does that organization fund um, a lot of foundations have uh, websites um, and they will uh, uh, post a lot of really good information on the website. So as soon as you hear about a foundation, <laughs> check to see if they got a website. Uh, Meyer Memorial Trust, for instance, they've got a very comprehensive website. Uh, on the other hand, um, Autzen Foundation, which is a family foundation here in Oregon, um, quite large, they give lots of grants, uh, they don't have any, any website at all. Uh, so what do you do? Well, one thing you can do is go to uh, guidestar.org. Um, i write that down. And at least look at their 990s. Guidestar, it's just one, one word, guidestar.org. And, uh, yeah, and you can type in the name of a foundation and they, all foundations are required to post their 990s. Now, why do you want to see a 980? Because uh, usually towards the end of the 990 form, they will have a list of all the organizations that they funded in the previous year and how much they gave to that organization. Now, in most cases, they won't get specific to the point of this is what they did with the money, uh, but you'll at least know what kind of organizations were funded and then you can follow up with research on that. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Well, if you've, if you've got the land donated, so you've got property already, you've got property to build on that is in your name? Oh, yes. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, but that's, that's a huge part of, of your total project, uh, is, is just having the property to build on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd say if, if, you've, if you have a piece of property that's been donated in your, the name of your organization, you have control of that property, then the next step is to look at, well, obviously, you know, what, what's it going to cost to construct this? I mean, capital projects are usually pretty complicated, and um, uh, it, it requires a lot of strategy because uh, generally one foundation will, alone will not fund uh, even sometimes a major portion of, of your capital project. So you've got to go to a lot of them. And, and the, whole, the, the timing that's involved in which foundations you go to first is really important, too. But, um, but you know, I, I would say you should follow that, yeah. Well, what about if we're from Vegas, and there's less money in there, and there's mm -hmm. no one, Uh, yeah, um, uh, I would, yeah, I mean, you could, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I would, uh, the way that I put it is to say that, um, uh, you know, we will acknowledge 
uh, any grants and donations that are given in some way. And, uh, and then later on, you'll find out which one is the biggest one. And you don't have to, start, you don't have to stop with just the building. You can have rooms within the building that are also uh, for, you know, named after different donors, et cetera. Okay, yes? Uh-huh. Um, let's say that because they didn't know whether or not they were going to get that, they went out for this, the same amount of money for three different foundations. Mm-hmm. And, and they wound up getting that same amount from two foundations. Uh-huh. What happens to the debt? I mean, in essence, they are meeting the requirements. They are spending the money and complying mm-hmm. with the trust. Mm-hmm. But they now have a potential surplus. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Well, do yeah. You always need to spend the money... The, the, exactly the way that you had in your proposal, unless you can go back, in, you know, in the, in the case that you're talking about, you've, you've, you've had one uh, grant maker who says, we'll, we'll fund it all, or maybe two, and but then you get another one who says, we'll also uh, give you a grant for that amount. You go to that foundation, you say, we are, we've been fortunate enough to get these grants, and we've got that funded but we do have another very urgent need, and this is what the need is, and would you fund that? How will they normally handle that? Is that normally the other pretty gracious in that amount? Or just mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've had, the, we, we've had a situation where that didn't, didn't work very well. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, it, it can be dicey because, because some foundations will say, you know, if you say my urgent need is um, this and this, and they'll say, but we don't fund that kind of thing. And then they'll say, well, we just can't help you. Okay. So, uh, k- yes? 30 years or so ago, there were public foundations by the director. Uh-huh. There are in some states. That, I mean, uh, in, here in Oregon, um, there was, I think there was one that was published last year, but that was after about five years when they didn't, they didn't, they're, they're published by a, a private company. So uh, if that company doesn't have enough money, they won't. Uh, so, um, but yeah, uh, if you, yeah, if, if you go to your library and, uh, uh, and ask in the reference section, the reference section they usually have a foundation data book. You want to look at that foundation data book and see what information they have there. Um, can, can, can I just say mm-hmm. just a few things? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talked about what grants are not. Okay, but I, I want to make sure you get this too. Um, think of your, um, this is what I wanted. Think of your grant application as the resume for your organization. Okay? Well, a, a resume shows your strengths, what you've done in the past, what your uh, competencies are. So, so look at that. It's also an invitation to enter into partnership. Partnership. That's, that's the key when you're thinking of foundations. You, 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 uh, how, what do I mean? You go to a foundation, you say, uh, give us $10,000. And they give you $10,000. You say, thank you very much. And that's it. No, they want to know that you've invested their money in a way where they feel very much involved in the whole process, okay? So you want to acknowledge, first of all, acknowledge that they've given you this grant, publish it, put it on your website. OCF gave us $10,000, yay. Um, make sure that you're reporting back to them because you, you may need to go to them next year for a different project, okay? So a grant is one strategy for your organization's growth. That's the key here. Always be thinking, how is this going to help us to grow? Not to stay in the same place, but to grow. And then an investment in your organization's future. Okay? I'm going to have the attorney here for a little bit, too. Uh, So it was was great to have him come and give you the basic information and uh, at least something to refer back to. Dave and I have a love-hate relationship. (laughs) I drive him nuts, basically. (laughs) 
because he keeps telling me these things, and for the past seven years, I've, I've been digging my heels in, and little by little, I comply with him. Little by little, I do what he says, and it's always for our better, but uh, I make him crazy, basically, and he brings in lots of money for us. So um, my one thing that I would say to you is uh, uh, wise men seek wise counsel. Dave knows what he's doing. Every dollar we spend on his time is well, money well spent. Even if we don't get the grant, it's going to compensate in another way. I highly recommend you find somebody who knows what they're doing in grant writing because it will pay off for you in the long run. It, it really will.